The topic of this lecture are basic statistical models and sampling. Note that from now on we are going to use data and see what we can learn about the population parameters from the data. The topics covered are covariance and correlation, and then we are going to talk about two theoretical concepts, the law of large numbers and the central limit theorem. Note that I will not go into the theoretical details, but I will show you using some examples of why those two concepts are very important. So let us first talk about covariance. So previously we have talked about the variance, which is a measure of how much does your data vary away from the mean or the spread around the mean. Now the covariance is a measure that tells you if you have two data sets or if you have two random variables, the covariance tells you of how the variables behave with respect to, the, to one another. So you need two random variables for this and you can calculate the covariance either using the equation that I have provided here on the slides or you can use a statistical software and I will come to this. Now what the covariance tells you is you have the sign of the covariance is either positive, negative or the covariance is zero. If the covariance is positive and you have the two random variables x and y. What this means is that x and y move in the same direction, meaning that if one random variable increases, the other random variable increases as well. And if one random variable decreases, the other random variable decreases as well. Now, when we have a negative covariance, that means that x and y are moving in the opposite direction. So one variable goes up, the other one goes down, or vice versa. If the covariance is zero, then we are talking about uncorrelated variables. Note that if two random variables, x and y, are independent, then x and y are also uncorrelated. Now, there are some issues associated with the covariance. Note that it is useful to determine the direction of change, that means whether it is positive or negative, but not the magnitude. Because the magnitude depends on the units of the random variables. So soon we are going to talk about the Meridian Hills dataset, where we have the random variable price and the random variable square footage. If in this case we are going to convert the square footage to square meters, then the covariance changes, despite the fact that nothing about the area of the house has changed. The concept of correlation coefficient overcomes this issue. Now, the correlation coefficient, what it does is it takes the units into account. So here on this equation, you have the correlation coefficient. Sometimes it is also called Pearson's R and very often it is denoted with the Greek letter rho. So to determine the correlation coefficient, you take the covariance between the two random variables x and y, and you divide by the square root of the variance multiplied with each other. So the variance of x times the variance of y, and you take the square root, and this is going to be in the denominator. Now, it is very important to realize that correlation does not mean causation. In a sense, just because two variables move together does not mean that one variable causes the other. And we are going to establish causation in the second part, um, or we are going to establish causation later when we talk about uh, regression analysis. Now, the advantage of the correlation coefficient is that it varies between negative one and one. So if you ever calculate a correlation coefficient by hand and you're getting something that is smaller than negative one or bigger than one, then you certainly made a mistake. Now also note that the variance is always positive. So we have the variance, which is positive, we multiply it by something else positive, and we are taking the square root of it, we are getting 
with certainty a positive number. So what this means is that the sign of the correlation coefficient depends on the cover depends on the sign of the covariance. Okay. So the sign of the correlation coefficient is the same sign than the covariance. Now, in this case, the sign provides, again, the direction. So if the correlation coefficient is positive, this means that the variables tend to move in the same direction. And if the correlation coefficient is negative, then the variables tend to move in the opposite direction. Now, what is important here is that the value of the correlation coefficient also tells you something about the magnitude. Okay, in the sense that if you have a correlation coefficient, say, that is equal to 1, what this means is that you can perfectly predict the movement of one variable based on the movement of the other variables. Okay, whereas if you have a correlation coefficient that is closer to 0, then it is more scattered, uh, the variables are more scattered. So let me give you some example here. So in the first quadrant up here, you have a correlation coefficient of 0.9. So you see that it is positive and it is close to 1. So what this means is that if one variable is high or if one variable moves, if one variable increases, the other variable increases as well. So you have them on this uh, more or less on this uh, on this line, if you will. Now, if you can see, if the correlation coefficient is slightly less, then the variables are going to be spread uh, more, going to be spread more across the space. Now, a negative correlation coefficient here, a correlation coefficient of point a negative point seven. You see that now the variables move in the opposite direction. So if one variable, if one random variable has a small value, the other random variable tends to have a higher value and vice versa. Okay. Note that a very small correlation coefficient, uh, it is not really able, you cannot really visually see how the variables move together. Okay. So let us see of what we have just learned and how we can implement this in MATLAB. So first of all, note that I have already the data set MH, which has the price, the bed, bath, and the square footage, and ignore the number for the, the square meters right now. Okay. So let us do the following. Let us first calculate the covariance between the price of the home and the square feet. So we type in COF, COF, and then we type in MH, the price of the home as the first random variable, and then the square footage of the house. So when we evaluate this, we get this matrix, okay? And note that what this matrix tells you is that you have first the variance of the price of the home, then you have the uh, you have the variance of the square footage, and then you have the covariance between the square footage and the price. And note that the values on the diagonal here. And here are identical, okay? Because it doesn't matter whether you take the covariance between price and square footage or square footage and price. Now, we have seen that in this data set, we also have the square meters of the house, okay? So square meters is simply the metric equivalent of the area of the home, okay? Now, note that nothing about the area of the home has changed, but we only changed the measurement. So now when we are calculating the covariance between the price and the square meters of the house, then we can see that the 
variance, of course, of the price has not changed, but now the variance of the, the covariance between the price and the square meters has changed, despite the fact that nothing about the relationship has changed. Now, as I mentioned before, the correlation coefficient takes the units into account. Okay? So note that if you type in core for correlation coefficient, and you take the correlation coefficient between the price and the square feet, and let us just do the same for uh, square meters, then you can see that in both cases, the correlation coefficient remains the same, whether we are measuring the area of the house in square feet or square meters. Okay, So that's the advantage of the correlation coefficient. Note that in this graph, you also have the scatter plot between the price and the square footage of the example I have just shown you in MATLAB. So next, let, let us consider the law of large numbers. Before we get into the unemployment rate in the United States, let us go over flipping a coin. Suppose I asked you to predict the share of heads after flipping a coin. Now, suppose I ask you that, well, I flipped a coin once and you have to predict the number of shares. So the natural answer here is, or the intuitive and correct answer here is to say the number or the share of heads after flipping a coin is going to be 0.5 or 50%. Now, when you are flipping the coin once, either it is heads or it is tails. So you can be off by 0.5 at least, you are going to be off by 0.5 in either direction. Now suppose that you are flipping the coin twice and again predicting the number of shares of heads you are going to say is going to be 0.5. There you see that well if you flip heads twice you're going to be off by 0.5 again. If you flip tails twice and if you flip twice and you get tails then you are going to get you are going to be off by 0.5 again, and only in the case where you are flipping one heads and one tails, you are going to be right. Now, of course, predicting the share after flipping a coin once or twice is going to be very difficult. But suppose that I ask you to predict the number of shares of heads after flipping a coin a million times. Now, what you will see is that the share of actual heads after flipping a coin a million times is going to be very close to 0.5. It is not going to be zero, it is not going to be one, but it is going to be somewhere between say 0.49 and 0.51. Okay, so what this means is that if the sample size or the number of times you are repeating this experiment increases, then your predictive power or the, the prediction gets more and more accurate. Basically, this is what the law of large numbers tells you. So let me show you uh, graphically. Here I have run a simulation where we flip a coin once and record the share of heads. Okay. So as you can see here, we have the first flip, the first coin flip, and the first coin flip was uh, tails. That's the reason why the share of heads is actually zero. Okay. But then if you flip more and more often, here is the, on the horizontal axis, you have the number of, tri of trials. Then you see that it approaches or it starts to approach the 0.5 that you would expect. In now, how does this relate to the unemployment rate in the United States? So the unemployment rate in the United States is measured by surveying 60,000 households where the, um, the Bureau of Labor Statistics calls randomly 60,000 households in the United States. 
and basically asks them whether they are employed, unemployed or not in the labor force. Now, if you compare the 60,000, the sample size of 60,000, this is significant, significantly larger than what you would see on the news when they are polling for a political candidate. Polling for a political candidate, candidate you usually have around 1,000 to 1,500 uh, respondents. Now, the reason why it is okay to have a poll at a smaller number than the unemployment rate is that there will be, and we will see this in, when we talk about confidence intervals, there will be a margin of error associated with the sample. Usually for a poll, when you poll about a thousand people, you have a margin of error of about plus or minus 3%. Well, if you had the same margin of error uh, for the unemployment rate of plus or minus 3%, that would basically be the difference between a recession and a boom. Hence, to be much closer to the actual unemployment rate, you need to sample many more people. Okay, That's the reason why the, the Bureau of Labor Statistics samples 60,000 households on a monthly basis. Now, before we continue, let us have a little refresher about the difference between a sample and a population. Remember that a population is the entire population and a sample is a subset of the population. We do sampling because sampling the entire population or trying to recover the unknown parameters that characterize the population may be very expensive or even impossible, okay? Plus, it could also be destructive. So think about, think about testing fuses or testing tires. The sample gets, or the tire or the fuse gets destructed during, uh, during sampling, and hence you cannot sample the entire population. Now, when we do a sample, and this is what we assume for all the data sets that we have uh, in the upcoming, uh, in upcoming um, lectures, is that we have a random sample in the sense that every item or person in the population has the same probability of getting selected into the sample. So if you're thinking about the number of voters in the United States, which are about 160, 170 million people, then if you are actually doing a poll, then each person needs to have the same probability of getting selected into the sample. Okay. So, for example, if you were to sample a thousand people on a college campus or during the NRA convention, then this sample is not going to be representative and it's not going to be random. So now let us get back to the estimation of the population variance. In previous lectures, we have seen that if we have a sample and we want to use the sample to predict the population variance, that we have to divide by n minus 1 instead of dividing by n. Now, in the following simulation, I want to show you of why the division by n minus 1 is a better estimator for the population variance than dividing by n. Suppose that, and here this is data that I have simulated, is that we have a population sample, that we have a population size of 100,000 people. And the mean of the variable of interest in this population is equal to 50 and the standard deviation is equal to 20. Okay? So here we have the mean of 50, the standard deviation of 20, which are the population parameters of the, of in, the population parameters of interest for the population. Note that in reality, you never know those mean and standard deviation associated with the population. Now, what we are doing next is we are doing a sampling in the sense that we sample people from the population, and here the sample size ranges from 2 to 50 people, and I repeat the sampling a thousand times. And the question is, 
can I recover the parameters of interest based on the sample that I have? Okay. Note that I also repeat the sample a thousand times because I'm going to take the average across the thousand samples. Okay. Again, this is uh, something we cannot do in reality because usually we have just one sample. But here you will see that it gets the point much better across. Now, let's consider what happens here on the next slide. As you can see, we have the estimate of the population variance on the, horizon on the vertical axis, and we have the sample size on the horizontal axis. The red line is, I estimate the variance, or I estimate the population variance by dividing by n, and with the green line, I estimate the population variance by dividing by n minus 1. Okay? So as you can see is that if the sample size gets larger, the difference is going to be very small. Because if you divide, for example, by 50 or by 49, this is not going to be a, a large difference. But see what happens if you estimate, if you're using the division by n versus the division by n minus 1. If you are dividing by n, your estimate of the population variance underestimates the true value. Okay, We know, and this is what I have on the previous slide, that the true standard deviation is 20, and across the thousand uh, samples simply having two, you can see that we can actually recover the correct estimate of the standard deviation by dividing by n minus 1 and not dividing by n. Okay, So this is the reason why when you have a sample, and you want to estimate the population variance, you have to divide by n minus 1. <clears throat> now, the next topic is about the sampling distribution and the sampler limit theorem. Now, before we have sampled across, uh, across the population, so imagine that you are interested in um, who is going to be elected uh, during a presidential election, the Democratic candidate or the, um, the Republican candidate, then what you're going to do is you're going out and you sample a thousand people. Let's say you're sampling a thousand people. And then you are going to record the uh, number of people or the share of people who would vote for the Democratic candidate versus the Republican candidate. Okay. Now the question is, if you were to repeat this polling of a thousand people over and over and over again, how would actually the fraction of people that go to one or the other, how would it vary over time? So intuitively, you would say that if you are uh, polling a thousand people, then say in the first estimate, you get that 45% are going uh, to the Democratic candidate. And then in the next sample, you would expect that about, say, 46 or 47% go to the uh, Democratic, Democratic candidate or lower. Okay, So the mean from the sample is going to vary across multiple samples. Okay, And this is where the mean of the sampling distribution comes into play. An extremely important concept in, with regard to the sampling distribution is the central limit theorem. Now, what the central limit theorem tells you is that independent of the underlying distribution, as the sample size increases, the sampling distribution of the mean will follow a normal distribution. So what does this mean? Suppose that you are going, suppose that you have the chance to poll people whether they're going to vote uh, Democrat or Republican. And at each sample, at each time step, you are sampling a thousand people. And with each sample, you are going to record the share of, let's uh, say, Democrats. Okay. Now, suppose that you are polling a hundred times a thousand people and you are recording the the share of Democrats for those hundred samples. 
that mean is going to follow a normal distribution of that shear. So this is what I have illustrated in the next slide, where I have taken three, uh, four, four distributions. Okay. So we have the uniform distribution, we have the Poisson distribution, and then we have the exponential and the beta distribution. Note that the exponential and the beta distributions, those are simply some other distributions that are in the family of distributions, very much like the uniform, the Poisson, or the normal distribution. Now, on the left-hand side, I always have how the population is distributed. Okay, so here we have the uniform distribution. Here we have the exponential distribution. Here we have the beta, the population associated with the uh, beta distribution. And here we have a Poisson distribution. Okay, note that the population, the, the random, the random variable associated with the population has different shapes. Now, what I do in a second step is I sample people out of the population and I record the mean. Okay, and I do this over and over again, and then I plot a histogram of the different means that I have obtained from the different samples. And what you can see is on the right hand side, for the uniform, the exponential, the beta and the Poisson distribution, is that the mean or the distribution of the sample mean follows the normal distribution. So when we are talking about uh, the importance of the bell curve or the importance of the normal distribution. Then uh, one of the reasons the distribution is so important is because of the central limit theorem. That no matter what the underlying distribution looks like, when you sample means repeatedly, you're always getting a normal distribution, meaning that the mean of the different samples is always normally distributed. Note that this also has implications for the standard error of the mean. Now, intuitively, the larger the sample size of each individual sample, the variance associated with the sample mean should decrease. Okay? So if you are polling, say, 100,000 people, whether they're going to vote for the Republican or the Democratic candidate, and if you do this sample multiple times of 100,000 people, then you would expect that the share, the predicted share, or the estimated share, is going to be, uh, is going to have a very small variance from sample to sample. Okay. So this is why the standard error of the mean, why we have the n in the denominator. If n gets very large, then the entire um, that the entire expression gets very small, meaning that the standard error of the mean is decreasing. Okay? Now, think about this when we are flipping a coin again. And note that I will soon move from the coin flipping example to, uh, the, sample, to the example of why insurances exist. So, if you are flipping a coin one time, then it is going to be very difficult to predict the share, okay? But if the sample size or the number of times you're flipping the coin uh, increases, then the predicted share is going to be smaller and smaller. So, for example, if you're flipping a coin a thousand times and you are repeating this experiment multiple times, then for each number of times when you're recording the, the share of heads, it is going to be very close to 0.5. Now, why is this important? Consider firms, uh, consider uh, insurance companies. Usually we expect, or usually we know that individuals as well as firms are risk averse. Risk averse means that they do not like risk. Then the question is why do insurance companies exist? Okay, now let me give you an example here. And suppose that we have an insurance company that insures homes and the probability of a fire destroying a home is 1 over 250. Now what I do is I simulate the damage of n homeowners where I vary n by uh, 
for various, where I vary n across various numbers. And then each time I calculate the share of destroyed homes. And I repeat this a thousand times and then generate a histogram. Now, this histogram is, the, order, the result of this histogram is displayed here. So in the first histogram, I only insure 1,000 people. In the second one, 10,000, 25,000, and 100,000 people. So what you can see is that, again, the probability of a house fire is 1 over 250. And hence, the probability of a fire is 1 over 250, meaning point, point oh 0.04. This is what we have. This is what we have here. Okay. Now, if I'm an insurance company and I only insure a thousand people, then I may have some years that are really good for me in the sense that no house burns down. And I may have years where well, almost 1% of homes burns down. So I have a very, I have a, a big variance in the number of homes that burn down. Now, if I increase the number of insured people, what you can see is that the really good years are eliminated, but also the really bad years are eliminated as well. What this means is that for an insurance company, since they can engage in risk pooling, they are not exposed to any risk, but they can predict very precisely of how many homes are going to burn down in a given year based on the number of people in, based on the number of people insured. Okay. Now, note that this is also the reason why you have, um, why this does not work for flood insurance. Here, we assume that the house fires, or the same is true for car accidents, that the claims are independent of each other, in the sense that my house burning down or me having an accident is independent of the same thing happening to you. Okay? Now, when you have, for example, flood insurance, that is not the case because a flood affects everybody. This is the reason why it is not practical, or it's not, um, it's not, uh, it's going, it would be very expensive if the insurance for floods was left to the private market, okay? So this is a little introduction into uh, basic statistical models and sampling.